Hey, welcome. So, I'm Prospector Jess from sourdoughminer.com and huntingforgold.com. Check out those sites. they got blog posts and videos and all kinds of goodies. Um, also, check out the product links on those pages. So, tonight we're going to talk about volcanoes, earthquakes, and gold. Now, why are we back on this topic of earthquakes again? Well, because the there is sort of a breaking news thing happening that I thought would be worthwhile investigating tonight. And it relates to gold in the sense that we've talked about the relationship and we've shown the gold mines. And look at the earlier videos I did this week, actually last week, 4th of July time frame, on uh, how gold and earthquakes relate and the area around Ridgecrest and Trona and Searles Lake. This episode I'm going to dive into where the quakes have been moving to over the last week. Fascinating progression of the faulting going north. You know, some would have you believe and it, you know, to a degree it's really true that the quakes are dying out and it's following a pretty normal course of action. But there have been a couple of oddities to this quake sequence that I thought I'd point out. One is that we, we saw earlier where they Initial quake jagged at an almost a 90 degree that basically we had a series of quakes heading north south and we had a series of quakes heading due west and then that sort of died out within within the point frame you know a day or two when the 7.2 hit all of a sudden it was all all bets are off because there was a huge mass of quakes covering up that east west jag it's still there and what it indicates and what they've said is it's the the north-south is what's called a right lateral strike slip, meaning that if you looked across to the east, it would look as though the, you know, because the screen's kind of reversed, it would look as though the material is moving, you know, to your, to your right on the opposite side, okay? That means that the western side of California moved a little bit north, just like the San Andreas. Interestingly enough, though, the jag that's headed due west was a left lateral, meaning it shifted. If we looked across it going north, we would see that same block moving east. So effectively, it's as though the whole thing rotated kind of from the east to the north. Does that make sense? That kind of movement. And that's what plates do. They have to kind of make these compound turns and stuff on a flat surface. And the way they do it is they break and then they move on any old surface they want. And so that's kind of what this quake did. Now. What's that got to do with tonight's show? Well, tonight's show, I'm going to talk about the connection between those earthquakes and a volcanic field that's of importance here in California. Did you know that there are eight, got them, eight volcanic zones in California that are considered by the Volcanic Observatory here in California? USGS has one of those here, like the one in Oregon that was watching Mount St. Helens. We have one here. And it's watching eight separate zones, which include Mount Shasta, Mount Lassen, of course. There's Mount, you know, there's a couple mountains in Northern California, and then there's uh, the the area around Mono Lake and and uh, westward toward uh, Mammoth Mountain, that whole area called the Long Valley. And then there's an area just north of San Francisco, which has to do with the whole Geysers region and and so forth. But there's also another one called. COSO, the COSO Volcanic Field. Hmm, if you've heard me talk in the last few nights about what's been happening, especially like two nights ago, this thing was headed toward the COSO Field and I was curious what might happen if it got there. Well, it got there. And so this is about kind of an article that I picked up that was written, supposedly published yesterday, but it missed the events of yesterday evening. And that's the way this whole quake system has been. It's been a series of, oh, surprise. So I'm going to show you a little surprise that popped up. Um, the surprise on this picture is me uh, with my dredge. <laughs> I just thought I'd include that for tonight. Just connect it to gold and dredging because because it, it somehow connects to volcanoes, which it does because that's where all this stuff comes from. But anyway, <laughs> I digressed. Oh, dear. So uh, what we're going to do is... Um, do a little bit of connect the dots. Oh, and check out the Sourdough Miner SIS. Uh, that's that offer. It's good until midnight on the 20, uh, whatever it is. Uh, anyway, uh, it's going to be good until that time, and then, and then it'll go away. Bye. 
and it's a discount, 200 bucks off. So check it out. Um, Let's see what we got here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, let's see. Okay, so what I want to show you is this this particular document. Uh, let's see, what should I start with first? Hmm, good question. Uh, so this is uh, <clears throat> the area around Coso Junction. And the area specifically for this set of volcanic, uh, we'll call it the Coso Volcanic Field, is right, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. It's going to take a little bit because I'm showing an awful lot of earthquakes. Um, but basically, you can see right in here, you know, this is called the Coso Range. But the field itself is down into as far south as having trouble seeing a specific zone because it's probably covered up by some quakes um, but basically down into this region right in here the lower part of this area as it heads up but once you get up to to uh, little lake um, in this area around lake highway you're past the, the starting point and you're well into the coso lakes uh, or the coso uh, volcanic field and what I wanted to catch your attention with was this 4.5 that took place on 7-11, that's today, at 00 -1437. So just after midnight, we got a nice big pop. We got one, you know, a little, let's see, a little bit after that, again, a 4.4. So clearly, uh, this thing is moving and making some pretty big noises. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's like there's a whole series of these. Uh, now, why I'm bringing this up is... Anything that's above about a four is something to pay attention to. If you recall, this whole earthquake sequence leading up to the seven one within two days started with about a four one, okay? And a four five is big enough to kind of catch your attention. It doesn't mean anything in and of itself, but it does mean you should watch. And specifically, if you start seeing a series of them like we saw here last night, okay? So uh, actually over the last few nights, uh, this one I think was earlier, uh, 710, so it was a day earlier, okay? So, uh, so this has kind of all been developing. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, here's the deal. Uh, let, me, let me show you what I'm getting at. So we are going to go open another document here, right here, USGS Volcanic Hazards Program. Remember I told you there's a, a volcanic observatory here in California. That's why the bear, okay, probably used to have a gold bar across here, but you know what that means uh, in California. So they, they still want the bears. Um, so here we go. The California Volcano Observatory Information Statement, July 11th, okay, 4.36 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So this afternoon. Um, so this document came out this afternoon, and I might be mistaken, but first thing, it describes that, that they detect nothing really abnormal in the volcanic field, because people are starting to catch on that this could be a problem, partly because under hazards, uh, earthquakes would precede the eruption by weeks to months. Hmm. Two types of eruptions can occur at the Coso Volcanic Field, okay? Uh, this is the deal that, that you should pay attention to. <clears throat> now, when we talk about magma, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me go to me. When we talk about magma and the generation of magma, maybe PJ Live, the whole deal. Okay, nope, that's not me. That, I mean, that is me, but come on. Uh, whoop, nope, yep, okay. So. This is a book called The Generation of Basaltic Magma. And it's all about, you know, stuff I learned on how volcanoes behave and where, where the stuff goes and comes from. Now, what I want to call your attention to out of this is the specifics about different kinds of, of you know, there's all kinds of charts in here about different kinds of magma. For tonight, we're just going to describe a simple formation. And that is in, in this particular kind of structure we have a situation we have a situation okay and that is just like in this picture right here let's see if i can get it to focus okay 
That is a thrust fault zone, okay? Like plates colliding. Behind it, on this side, are two magmatic structures coming up and protruding through the surface, depositing lava and, and volcanic deposits. What we're talking about in our case here is we have a zone where just such a magmatic source exists underneath it that is coming up from the, the mantle it did millions of years ago protrude through there and spew out a whole bunch of lava. That's what the coastal field's about. It's three separate sets of eruptions. One of them was a long time ago, and that's the biggest eruption, which actually wasn't the biggest. It was a fairly significant, but not a huge eruption. The significance of it was it was largely basaltic. It was magma coming up from the mantle, and so it was heavy in what we call mafic material, which makes it very fluid. So it flowed through fissures. And it spewed out through volcanoes and made, you know, certain kinds of cones. The problem is, as it evolved mid-time, it starts spewing out a little more what we call sialic, which means it has more quartz in the content, and that makes it a lot more viscous, okay? And at that point, it started erupting in terms of very, uh, what we would call, uh, as they call it, uh, let me show you this picture. Let's go to this full screen thing. Okay. Um, let me let me move this over a little bit. So very energetic explosions of ash and tephra may occur if more silicic magma occurs. In other words, this is the kind of thing that happened up at Mount St. Helens or happens in you know, Krakatoa, or happens in uh, some of the things you see, it, it's some of the more major interesting things in in, uh, uh, in Italy, when we have these massive explosive eruptions. Very different animal from the very calm and spewing things, which are dangerous nonetheless, but nowhere near as violent that you see coming out of Kilauea or Mauna Loa in Hawaii, because those are basaltic. This guy, when it wants to erupt, it'll do one of two kinds of things, depending upon how much silica is in there. It'll either explode, boom, or it'll just start spewing out very large tephra flows full of all kinds of pyroclastic bombs. You know, these are, uh, uh, can be thick gobs of foamy molten lava, or they can be little tiny spirals of glass, you know, which is essentially what we call pumice and ash. And so what ends up happening is that stuff goes everywhere and messes up everything and can screw up because several major things come down from there. The aqueduct exits that lake, Lake Highway. So if there is a problem, the LA, one of the wings of the LA aqueduct gets shut down, even if it's a quake and it's getting really close. And we're talking a couple miles. So, okay, that's an interesting development Two, as it, as it potentially causes this eruption, that could nail all of the western side or eastern side of california's power feed from the eastern u.s because it comes down the backbone of the sierras right through that area so that's two big hits for la and san diego and you name it okay so this is one of the ones where these guys the usgs and the hazard group are monitoring of those eight areas in california and the reason why they say that is the big one might not be the big one we're thinking about. It might be something like this. And one of the areas they pegged was the coastal volcanic field because it doesn't take much of a volcano in that area to really disrupt things and mess up you know, our modern life. Like your Tesla cars couldn't charge because there's no power, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but don't worry because the gas guys can't go either because there's no power because <laughs> they can't pump the gas. It becomes a problem. So um, anyway, I just thought I'd post this a little bit and tell you a bit about the kind of thing. You know, iridescent flows of basalt could be fascinating and still might mess things up, but it's nothing like what would happen if you got a big lava dome that exploded, which is less likely. More likely you're going to get somewhere in between basaltic lava flows and tephra and ash. You're going to get these cinder cones in, in a fireworks show, but that fireworks show would tend to mess up air flight and power and water. And that's three big things that use our, you know, our modern life. And it would pretty much be everywhere around, uh, you know, San Francisco to San Diego, you know, just kind of screw up California. So uh, that's Prospector Jess. I just thought I'd throw that one out there. It's, it's a developing thing 
the main thing I wanted to bring your attention to was this this kind of wing of quakes that's showing up, and and kind of where that where that uh, whole thing, let's get this right, um, where that whole thing is going to. Uh, as it travels and by that I mean you see here here's the Lake Highway and the aqueduct exits right right here okay and you can see the quakes right here and what's been happening is they've been kind of kind of started swinging down here early on the let's see the sixth after the seven one this is when this stuff broke through this area but what's fascinating is then it kind of started up here with one and then it kind of just pop 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 and it's continued for the week, moving its way northward. And so the northernmost larger quake happened last night uh, of this whole sequence. And that was this 4-5, to highlight it. And so uh, that guy took place at, at 1437, so 15 minutes after midnight, universal time. Um, could probably set that to local time. Yeah, there we go. So 17, 14, 37 on the 10th. So that was last, yesterday evening at 1700, okay? So, uh, and then, uh, so five o'clock, a little after five. And then came these other guys, which were later, a little later. But you get the idea. It's, uh, it's definitely one of these things we just want to keep our eyes on. And it may not develop into anything. It may, may be of interest, but I would certainly, uh, based on this, kind of keep my shoes in the car and that kind of stuff, be ready. Um, not trying to make everybody, you know, afraid. That's silly. But uh, what I'm trying to do is make you just uh, intelligent about your decision capability, intelligent about some things. Not a conspiracy theory here. I'm not a conspiracy nut. I am interested in the science of earthquakes and the science of seismology and volcanology. These are two areas of geology that kind of merge in this area, which is fascinating to me. And um, I spent a whole bunch of time in my early geology stuff doing a whole survey of this area, <laughs> believe it or not. Walked it in the heat. It was bad. But, um, but I learned a lot about rocks and minerals and a lot about volcanoes and earthquakes uh, by doing that. And, and it's fun because as this thing cracked open, it started heading in this direction. I said, hey, I've been there. I've done that. That's pretty neat. So uh, just be aware. Um, all you want to do is kind of keep your eyes open for what's going on. Keep your alert system going. Um, you know, people are all panicked over the alert, not firing here in Southern California. That's a bunch of baloney. You know, the reality is you don't want crying wolf every day. You know, a 7-1 in this area didn't i mean it didn't do anywhere near the damage it could have done to ridgecrest had it been a little closer but ridgecrest being a little lower than la didn't get as much damage as la would have but the fact is in la i think they had one place burn because of a short don't know what that was probably close to burning to start with they had one or two water mains rupture which people often don't know about but that stuff happens anyway we've had a number of earthquakes that left the system just on the edge of breaking anyway. That happened a bunch after the Northridge quake. We had ruptures going on for years and they were all connected to, in fact, they went through in Thousand Oaks, which is west of, of Northridge by quite a bit. They went through the next two years and replaced water main connections because they saw this pattern that they were, they were weak and the quake had settled things enough that all of them were starting to break in a sequence and it was kind of random. So they just decided to take them all out and put up in new tees because they, they just were not strong enough and they had cracked in the quake and when they failed they would take the road out which was really expensive <laughs> so uh, this is another night to just talk about volcanoes quakes and gold and of course going back to gold you know we've talked about how the connection is that the lava and the min minerals in in hydrothermal deposits can come up and concentrate that gold near the surface if it comes through the surface of course even more so um, these tend to be more dacite and rhyolite uh, type intrusions recently. Originally, they were more basaltic, which is high in iron, very dark and black. As it goes to dacite and rhyolite, it moves toward a, a kind of a you know pink and white kind of color. 
and and has a much more viscous can be a more glassy kind of material like you know can be obsidian kind of material or other stuff like that so you just want to kind of be aware of the basic differences and what that means essentially to you in terms of gold it isn't that you're going to find a gold thing exposed by the lava flowing out it's that it provides vents and cracks for the gold to be moving into it also provides an opportunity for fissures to open up places and lift stuff that exposes areas that erode and deposit gold. But the time frame for that is, you know, hundreds to thousands of years for it to erode enough to, to, you know, show that gold. Unless there was already something there and it kind of exposed it more. That could be interesting. You know, if something were close to the surface and it got exposed, this, this could do it. But, you know, I've had, I've had a number of, number of questions from people about whether or not this brought gold to the surface and the answer is it doesn't work that way <laughs> it, it provided more opportunities for gold to be deposited it provided opportunities for things to fracture and erode more quickly if a flood were to occur through this area which they do and it were to occur down some of the fault gouge it might scrub out some material that contains gold that's a possibility if the fracture went through that gold gold bearing material uh, the probability of that's kind of low given the size and the and the kind of preference for quakes to just cut through rock wherever it's weak. But the fact is that interfaces like the fissures where the gold was deposited can be a weak spot. So it could have cracked along one of those fissures. It's, it's been known in, you know, and rumored in the past uh, with old gold prospectors that they would find gold that had been kind of uh, revealed by a quake. Uh, and that's not unusual given landslides and things like that happen and but a lot of landslides happen around this area too there's a there's another tool that shows you landslides the probabilities and it it just the whole area just kind of lit up and there were pictures from up in trona where it was just pitch black well not pitch black it was kind of grayish brown color with headlights and that was the the rock slides and the dust that had gotten thrown up after that seven one so it does happen but not that frequent um that you'd find gold after something like that so i will call that a night let's take a look at our stream um, check to make sure you're all here and we'll close it out we're live now got a bunch of comments and we'll close it out there we go so audio is good we're good for the night hey charles facebook is messing up well i think the replay should be good if it's not i'll be reposting but uh, that's I'm sorry to hear Facebook is messing up um, but that's Facebook super cool to listen to your wisdom and knowledge on the subject says Anthony well, thank you I appreciate the input and Bob says this quake stuff is interesting in itself it is and yet I, I really want to make sure we don't veer too far away from gold because they are connected trust me uh, the, the, but the reality is it's real easy to uh, let's see dive deep go down the fissure uh, <laughs> get distracted uh, because quakes and volcanoes volcanoes are a whole nother ball of wax uh, uh, ball of molten material uh, but yeah it's it is interesting and what's fun here with uh, with this coso thing is you know you look at this picture let me see if i can go to the full screen um no, 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 not that one yes and and this thing right here is of interest the other thing I've been watching out for here is there's a bunch of them right over in this. They're butted up against this. There's like a little uh, uh, bluff a mountain that they've butted up against on that side, too. And I don't know what that's all about. You know, typically when you see bigger quakes, it means there's a bigger uh, amount of resistance to movement. And it's built up enough energy to break through that. And so this system, because that 7-1 was so big, is, is able to move a lot of energy upstream. So the energy, the stress and strain are building across this thing have moved outward and, and are spreading. They typically spread in kind of a, a what they call a butterfly pattern. And so what happens is you'll oftentimes find that the main fault will break and then stuff all around it will wake up. And that has to do with the way that the, the strain that's released, once that thing moves, it creates a strain um, you know, stress is the pressure, the force strain is the, the bending. So what happens is other things start to bend and, and they load up and as they load up, they break, but they break in this really odd pattern. It was quite visible after the Northridge quake. And I'm seeing it again here. 
uh, after that first quake, we saw two jags, and now we've seen it kind of go <laughs> outward. And it's like, that's the normal pattern you want to see. What that means is the localized energy, the stress that's built on that one fault is now being redistributed amongst all these faults out here. And at some point it'll die out. That's the way it's supposed to work. My only thing is this area I've circled in red is, hmm, it's supposed to die out, <laughs> but it keeps popping a little further forward. And, and this area up in here is the Owens Lake that has in historic time uh, erupted with a pretty good one, about a seven, eight. And, and this area right in here is it, that I've circled. It really, it's more like this whole area through here is, is all that volcanic field. And so it becomes an area of interest to me as a geologist to look at this thing and say, you know, this is, this is geology in action. You don't get to see the dynamics of these systems. The statement on that article I showed you earlier basically said, no, we don't think there's any, and they were basically saying that the biggest quake here was a 4-1, but we just showed you there's a 4-5 that happened last night. So clearly the data they got that report from for this afternoon came from probably yesterday or the day before, and it take, takes a while for them to write a report and vet it. Um, so it's stale. And, and the fact is that a new 4-5 says, wait a minute, it isn't done. Because they were basically saying it's dying out by evidence that the biggest quake there has been 4-1. Well, the biggest quake happened last night, and it was also the largest quake in this whole sequence, the farthest north. That At that point made me, hmm, I wonder if. Now, another one happened later, which was a large one, but not as large. Um, and so, you know, anytime you see a 4-5, you kind of ask yourself, is this going to trigger something? Because it's essentially showing you there's still some built up, some built up energy up there. And if it happened to hit something that had a lot of built up energy and we didn't know about it, which is exactly what this first quake was, they didn't realize how big the energy stored there was. They didn't even know there was a fault. So, you know, you take what's said with a grain of salt in any of these things. Uh, geology is a non-exact science. It has exact components, but it's not like, uh, you know, electronics in a circuit or, or like... Uh, uh, it is more like astronomy where you're looking out there and you're sort of hypothesizing what could cause the weirdness you're seeing. Same thing here. So, um, and my hypothesis is that the thing is moving the energy forward and it is now, a lot of these quakes are fairly shallow, like one mile down. Uh, this 4.4 here is 1.9 kilometers. So when they're that shallow, a fairly small quake feels very big. It also means that something is stressed causing, you know, has these, this stored energy up higher, which could be a different kind of material that's higher, like a magma, uh, vent or a magma, uh, uh, pipe. And somehow this could crack and fracture that. The question is, does it crack and fracture that and hit the thing they're concerned about, which is down below fairly shallow in this area. They've been you know, using it for geothermal energy. Fairly shallow is, is the magma source, molten rock. So could it, could it cause that rock to come forward? Uh, not, probably not, but you know, it's just keep an eye on it. That's all. It's just something to watch for. It's like weather. You know, it gets fascinating. So don't freak out. Just watch. Be aware. Prospector Jess, over and out. Good night. Catch you then. Good prospecting. And don't forget to check out the sourdoughminer.com SIS. Systematic prospecting, how I look for gold and find uh, plasters and pockets and loads and stuff like that so that you can basically find more of it. How you, how you go through that in a systematic way. Check it out. Catch you then and good prospecting.